I was just more of a chaotic person who was like chaotically using drugs and alcohol and like going out and causing a fuss in some group of friends and then pinballing off to another group of friends and upsetting them or not friends but you know associates at the pub yeah so chaotic and really um a mess and the sort of person you probably try and avoid now I mean I just probably, <laughs> <to be honest. laughs> Boom, what's happening, beautiful people? Just before we jump into the podcast episode, I wanted to tell you about my brand new book, 99 Problems But Addiction Ain't One, 11 Definitive Steps to Get Recovery Without Going to Rehab. We're living in crazy times um, and it's getting harder and harder to access help. So I won't hold you up too long, but we've just launched this new book. We've got a super special offer on it. There will only be a limited time. You can get the digital copy copy plus the audio book plus seven free bonuses there's heaps of stuff in there for only five bucks australian all right so click the link below grab the book do yourself a favor take advantage of the offer because it won't hang around forever now let's stop interrupting this show and get into the podcast boom what's happening everybody uh welcome to another episode of real drug talk and depending on where you are in the country, another few days in lockdown. <laughs> We're certainly feeling that here in Victoria. So it's always actually really good when we have a lockdown um, because it kicks my butt into gear and makes me focus on doing a little bit of content and putting a few podcasts together and putting some stuff out there, which people have a little bit more extra time on their hands to listen to and request it and stuff like that, which is really cool. Um, now, I always I don't know if you've listened to any of my other shows, Jenny, but I always get a little bit nervous with people's names because I just like butcher things. And even though you told me just before we started recording, I'm going to have a go. But if I muck it up, you can backhand me when you see me. So uh, today on the show, we got Jenny Valentish. No. Valentish. Valentish. <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> um, but uh, I was saying I was saying to Jenny before we started recording, um, we connected, oh, I don't even know how long ago it was now. Um, uh, Jenny was just doing an article for a newspaper and was just talking to me about it. And um, I, I, didn't, I didn't know about her then. And then, yeah, went, went stalking on the internet and found some of the stuff and love everything that she puts out and has kind of become a bit of a virtual mentor for me these days um, and has a pretty inspiring story i think because i always like to see people um i think you know we have a tendency i don't know if you agree we have a tendency to talk about people that are in this space like oh how fucked up their life was and you know all that sort of stuff but we never kind of talk about all the amazing stuff that people do um so jenny's one of those people that's done some pretty cool stuff so we're excited to have her on the show how you going mate i'm all right yeah as you mentioned we're we're in lockdown here in vic and uh the mood has taken a bit of a dip, but um, here I am talking about myself. So presumably it's going to soar again. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So um, you're the author, author of a brand new book as well. Um, Everything Harder Than Everyone Else. Uh, why Some People Push Our Bodies to the Extremes. Love the cover. Um, we'll put that in the show notes for everyone as well that's not watching. Um, so... We'll talk a little bit about your story, but what inspired you to write this book? Because it's a pretty interesting title and I've had a bit of a um, skim through some of the notes and, and it's got some pretty interesting um, topics in there. The title is Pure Bravado and it kind of, <laughs> yeah, it kind of taps into uh, a bit of my previous book, which was about addiction. I was thinking about I don't know about you, I suspect you were the same, but when I was young and discovering drugs and alcohol, I wanted to be the first to do every single drug. <laughs> and the best. <laughs> yeah, and the best and the last to leave. Um, and so I had this mentality of everything harder than everyone else. It was super yeah. important to me. I was very competitive about drug taking. Um, and so this book is actually about people who have these other kind of extreme pursuits like bare knuckle boxing and other kinds of fighting and bodybuilding and wrestling but it is based on that kind of a mentality of people who also have a past in addiction yeah where it's about endurance and testing your limits and treating yourself as a human science experiment and perhaps not bizarrely quite a lot of my interviewees do also have a history of addiction wow interesting it's funny you bring that up actually i 
I, I've spoken about it a couple of times, um, but I don't hear many people talking about it um, uh, when they're telling their addiction stories or whatever, but it is such a common theme is that people have that real like competitive thing about them where they like take drugs competitively. And it's weird, like people that are outside the space and haven't had those experiences kind of think it's strange and don't understand it, but it's a common thing that, that happens. We do, well, we also have a tendency to, we're now in this phase of thinking within the drug and alcohol sector and generally in society where we look at addiction as being a mental health problem uh, or the result of trauma, and that's often true. But then yeah. we kind of forget to say, well, also there are enjoyable aspects of it, or drugs actually provided people with useful tools, or they just liked getting high. Like we forget, yeah. kind of like one or the other. We can we forget it can be both. A hundred percent. It's actually one of my pet hates at the moment, um, but it's a weird one because it's kind of. Um, it's good in some ways that there's more awareness around, yeah, the trauma stuff and all, all those sorts of things. But I just hate that statement that, you know, like everybody's that's addicted to something it's because of a trauma response. I'm like, yeah. no, it's fucking not. Yeah. It's very funny because before we started this interview, I said, you said, is there anything you're uncomfortable talking about? I said, I'm trying to talk about trauma. And then I brought it up in like the first five seconds. <laughs> it's hard not to in this space. It's hard it not to. So um, can you, do you mind um, telling us just, just for um, people listening, like, yeah, what, what is your story um, with, with addiction and substances? Um, and were you always um, a writer or has that been something that's happened through your process of change or? There was a real duality with my addictive behavior because like we were just saying, so on the one hand, I started drinking very heavily like every day at 13 and it was, yeah. I was very depressed yeah but it also lit my brain up like a christmas tree like because i used to drink dad's spirits just neat when i got home from school and my head was like boom yeah it was so exciting because i've also got that thrill seeker novelty seeking side to me so it was these two things going on that were a bit of a you know a deadly combination yeah <laughs> um <laughs> That. And then, of course, my competitive side kicked in as soon as I thought about drugs. I went to the library and I would get out books on drugs so I could see what was out there. Wow. Oh, my God, like, so exciting. Like, reading about, I don't know, like, going into a sweet shop, really. Just reading yep. about all the uppers and downers and this and that and reading books like Go Ask Alice, which is supposed to be cautionary tales. I'd be like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like feeding my teenage brain with excitement. And I was really into like counterculture. And I used to collect in my later teens, I collected lots of fanzines from the United States from people who were living on the fringes. And they were talking about their drug use. And they were talking about, you know, like out there sex and problematic lives. And so it was all like just And was this in the UK? Did you grow up in the UK? Yeah, I grew up in a place called Slough, which is outside London. Uh, and it is a pretty uninspiring, disappointing town. So yeah. again, escapism, escapism was really hardwired into me. Um, but you also asked about writing. I, I used to write from, right from being a very small child. I used to like bang out plays on this typewriter that mum and dad got me in. And I did a newspaper for the street. Well, yeah. I don't think anyone actually got a copy. But I used to <laughs> So, yeah, that was, I knew right from the start I wanted to be a journalist and a writer. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, just out of curiosity, and tell me if I'm, uh, I don't know if you're nationalistic at all to, you know, England or London or the UK or whatever. But when I went there, right, like I stayed in the, um, obviously like the touristy bit as you do. But I remember like we got the little boat down the, what's that main river that runs down the heart. Um, and I remember we got kind of just outside a little bit towards the non, not towards the palace the other way. And I saw um, like the houses and stuff that people live in. And, and anyway, I was with my mate that yeah, lives in London. And I said, Oh, is that like kind of normal or is that just like a inner city? And they were like, yeah, that's like a, what a London suburb or typically can kind of look like. And it was like super depressing. Is that like a thing there? Do you think that's like a, not to, sorry to any of the English listeners. Um, but yeah, like, is that, 
do you think that had a big impact on you like your environment yeah I mean I don't think that's a very accurate view of London really it's <laughs> completely different and the socioeconomic kind of spectrum is huge yeah but um there are a lot of shit towns there's even a book called shit towns um <laughs> and and you know they all have like the super cheap Weatherspoons pub serving underage kids and um really depressed people kind of at the end of their tether end of tether spoons they should call it yeah um, so i don't know i mean there is a big drinking culture and it is it can be a bit of a gloomy place um definitely the drinking culture is different to australia in that it's more aggressive i think like in that right. people are using it like almost sort of angrily like knocking back pints and doing way more shots than I see here and really cheap shit drinks and getting two for ones. And yeah, it's really aggressively marketed at people as well to, to get two for one deals at the bar and, yeah, uh, you know, flaming some boop of this and whatever that. Um, so you, you tend to see more people carrying massive trays of shots in the UK and like drinking like they're a lemming off a cliff than you right. do. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, so that's kind of how it started for you. How did it like progress? Um, yeah. I've listened to some of your story and it kind of got to a point where you weren't happy with it, obviously. Well, yeah. I mean, pretty much straight away I knew I was in trouble. <clears throat> I mean, I knew I was in trouble by the age of 14, but yeah. um, I, so I would periodically stop, but usually just for a month, like wait for something to blow over <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and back on it. Um, and the, but I've discovered amphetamines i've discovered speed so yeah. not speed in australia where it's meth but like amphetamine sulfate which is a bit gentle <laughs> <laughs> uh and that you know it, it it served a real purpose like it made me like people more yeah you know? it gets the serotonin going and uh it makes you more talkative and it means you can drink more because you are sober it was like the perfect combo for me so I sort of blithely went about pushing that to its limits and then got amphetamine psychosis and, and it, like it just kept reoccurring and reoccurring and reoccurring and I, I'd hear things, um, be hallucinating. Um, so that was probably a real low point around 22, 23. Yeah. And I had to stop taking speed. But then but I used to take, I mean, I took pretty much everything I, I could. Uh, yeah. I just... Um, I wasn't trying to numb myself. I've never quite got that. It, like, I think maybe one or two drinks may, n- might numb feelings, but then yeah. it's clear it goes the opposite way, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I was just more of a chaotic person who was like chaotically using drugs and alcohol and like going out and causing a fuss in some group of friends and then pinballing off to another group of friends and upsetting them, or not friends, but, you know, associates at the pub. Yeah. So chaotic and really... Um, a mess and the sort of person you probably try and avoid now. I mean, I just <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like from what you're describing, right? Um, is that is that where the interest lies for you with the book that you've just written? In you know, people after these kind of inverted commas extreme pursuits or pushing themselves to the extreme, because it, by the sound of how you're describing it, correct me if I'm wrong, like you. It sounds like you don't really feel like your addiction, like we we're talking about just before, was about you know escaping something or numbing something. It was more tied into like your um, personality and and you know um, biochemical function and stuff like that. Would that be fair, or was there other stuff involved that you think pushed you there? Oh yeah, there's definitely other stuff as well. I was in huge emotional pain. Yeah, And I've written about it in my previous book. I'm sort of loath to go into it too much, but just like some childhood stuff and family relationships yeah. uh, had me pretty screwed up. And yeah. that's a long time to get on top. Of. I couldn't get on top of that stuff until I quit drinking at 34. I just, you know, no amount of seeing a shrink was helping while I was still using that kind of behavior. Yeah. So, and then I took eight years off drinking. And in that period, I worked so hard. Like, you know, I did lots of therapy. I read a lot. I really tried to reroute all the pathways, install healthy new habits. Um, so I didn't waste a second of it. And yeah. it's, I think it's worked. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So um, I'm interested just to un- unpack a little bit as well with that, because it's 
something that we get a lot of feedback. People often message us on you know, Instagram or whatever it is after podcasts, asking, asking questions and, and things like that. But um, people are so interested in like the treatment process, you know, um, and um, I don't know, we're just finding that so many people are not like connecting with it. Like what was your experience of that? process did you go through kind of traditional avenues or was it something different or yeah and and even just as a um because i know you talk about this a lot as well um yeah just as a as a as a female you know going into those spaces and and you know i'm i'm also loathe to use the word but like in that kind of recovery format (laughs) yeah i decided to just throw as much mud at the wall as possible like just throw stuff at the problem so I I didn't go to rehab but I went to outpatient services at Turning Point and I went to AA and I went to Smart Recovery yeah and I went to therapy um specifically addiction therapy and I carried that on for a long time yeah so uh, I did all those things and I I found AA quite a struggle just because well, for a lot of reasons, <laughs> can't really do it just because. <laughs> uh, but I also don't want to take pop shots at it because it's helped so many of my friends and you know people in general. But yeah. it worked for me. Yeah. And I, I think you know there is a bit of an argument that maybe it's not always great for women because it's it's encouraging you to sort of hand over your power, isn't it, to a higher power? Yeah. Um, and also you know to sort of really um kind of like humble yourself for want of a better word and then for a lot of women that maybe they haven't had much power yeah and maybe what they actually really need is to take their life into their own hands with guidance from professionals and um and sort of reclaim that uh but i mean yeah i also have lots of female friends who who you know, went for about 10 years and really got a lot out of it. Um, for me, I preferred something like smart recovery where it's about self-management, yeah. it things like CBT and, you know, mindfulness and motivational interviewing, things that my kind of practical journalist brain could go, ah, oh, yeah, well, I can read up on that as well and I understand that. And, yeah. Um, so I did that and um, saw an amazing addiction psychologist, really, really awesome guy. And it was like he could read my mind. You know, wow great feeling isn't it when you felt misunderstood for years and uh like people just aren't getting you probably because you're completely nuts um to then have someone who (laughs) understands because they've been there as often you know people who work in the field have been there uh and have just seen it so many times and seen the patterns and understand the family dynamics that they can just understand immediately yeah 100 (laughs) percent. and i think um like I, I don't know if I've talked to talked to you about it, but I I won't like fully go into the story and, and bore the listeners. But to me, it's like this whole world is kind of opening up because when I went into treatment, I was young and and I went through kind of the traditional pathways. And my initial reaction was I struggled with it, like I really did. And then I was just fucked and wanted my life to be different. So I I kind of like even though I struggled with it, I just like gave into it and then got really like sucked into it. And for a couple of years, I feel like I've had the real like um, polar opposites of each side of it. You know, like I, I was really involved in it. I was like the poster fucking child for a couple of years there. Right. And then I don't know, as I went on, there was just like, I kind of woke up or something and there was just some stuff that didn't make sense to me anymore. I kind of got my, I, my joke is I kind of got my brain back and yeah, like things just didn't make sense. And then it's so like interesting talking to people like yourself that had a completely different experience from the start, meeting lots of different people that have been successful in other ways um, and exploring that. So I'm, I'm just interested to ask like, where are you at? Like, and how do you talk to people if anyone asks you for advice? And by the way, everyone, we're not just giving pseudo general advice out to everyone here. It's a, it's a individual process, but where are you at? Is, is it like if people have an addiction, are they always addicted and they can't use substances again, or they can have a different relationship or yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually what you were just saying reminded me of my key 
thing that I didn't like about 12 step, which was it, it makes the assumption that you need to go forever and you're never going to be well. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so that was my big problem with it. Uh, I thought that's a bit defeatist. <laughs> um, I don't want to be going to meetings for the rest of my life. I think you should be able to, you know, really immerse yourself in something, really try and understand it. And then hopefully you won't need it anymore. But that wasn't the yeah. attitude. Of it. It's like, no, you, you need to come forever. Or you're going to end up dead in a mental institute or I forgot what the other one, hospital is. Yeah. Um, so that was my main problem. So I, I now I do drink um, and I have done since I think 2018. And in my mind, it's successful drinking. Yeah. <laughs> in that, um, like I usually would only have one or two and I, I don't have that thing anymore of if I ever had even one sip, boom, brain is switched on revving. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't only have one. I was that person. And now I can. And I can't explain that apart from I took a long time off and I'm not like really yeah. this anymore. Um, Do you have any theories? Because I find it fascinating because this is like the experience that I've heard from a lot of people. There's usually a period of time of stopping whatever the thing is and then you know, something shifts, something changes. Well, I mean, the neuro, the neuroscience theory would be that when you've been doing something which is very dopaminergic for a long time, your reward system is so, like, it highly revved and it needs large amounts of it, but then you're very yep. sensitized. So you are casting around for it all the time. When you've stopped that, your reward system isn't doing that. Yeah. Um, so that is probably the explanation for why I can stop now. Uh, I just never, ever, ever, ever gave myself a break when I was drinking, ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably what the problem was. But also um, on a more sort of like uh, on a wider landscape, I've now completely reprioritized everything in my life. So number one priority is sport and training. Yeah. And I... I, there's no way because I train six days a week. There's no way I'd want to have a hangover. Yeah. So it's just pushed everything in a different order. Um, and also, I hate the feeling of being out of control now. So I hate the feeling of like more than say three drinks. We start to feel a bit kind of loose and tipsy. Don't like yeah. that anymore. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. It's interesting. It's very interesting to me. So and I kind of wanted to segue there as well about some of the some of the topics that you cover in, in the new book um, as they kind of relate to addiction, because there's so, and, and I don't know if it's true. I, I'm all, like part of the reason why I do this podcast, right. Is so that I can have conversations with people like you and try and fucking work it out for myself yeah, yeah, <laughs> as cool. I go. So, so like you, you mentioned that, you know, the sport now is like the priority in your life. Um, and what's the sport by the way? It's mainly Muay Thai, but I also do pole and Filipino stick fighting. Awesome. Filipino stick fighting. That's cool. It's called Arnis. It's called Arnis. Oh, nice. I like it. Um, uh, so, so that's become the main priority and that's six days a week. Um, and that's a, a, around, I assume, work, family, friends, you know, life. Um, so that's like a dedication that's kind of needed the same thing as any kind of addiction. Like, do you feel like there is that people have like that, I don't know if you call it an addictive personality and it just, tr you, you need to channel it into other areas or yeah. Yes. So pretty much everyone in the book. And as I say, like there's people who there's people who are into flesh hook suspension, BDS, BDSM, into bodybuilding, wrestling, combat sports, anything kind of extreme, ultra running. Ultra running. Ultra yeah. running's insane. <laughs> yeah, yes, quite insane for me. But they all are what I would call natural born leg jigglers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to pathologize, you might call it anxiety, but I just see it as like this restlessness. It's got to go somewhere. Yeah. And so, like, if I used to go to the pub when I was heavy drinking, I would need about three drinks before I could even sit down at the table for yeah. more than five minutes. Yeah. I used to make excuses like, I'm just going to the toilet or I'm just going to, I'm just going to get something. I was going to buy some cigarettes. And I just, it was because I couldn't sit still. Yeah. So these people in the book have found a really productive way of dealing with that shit. 
Yeah. And it so is a interesting. Very extreme pursuit that, you know, like in the case of the deathmatch wrestler, he gets to like run around a ring screaming at the top of his lungs and like staple gunning people and flying through the air. And <laughs> that, that, you know, that serves, I'm sure if he didn't have that, oh, I shouldn't make assumptions, but I know that some people I interviewed came from pasts of heavy drug use or alcohol use. And as soon as they quit, they slung, they flung themselves into this other kind of extreme thing. And that worked really well for them. A hundred percent. And it's, I think that's a big fact fact that needs to be talked about more because um i've had conversations with a guy that we had on the podcast not a couple of shows ago um paul taylor but and he's just like extreme in a lot of things and he kind of says to me you know that if he didn't have these kind of pursuits he feels like maybe if he picked up something else he would be in trouble this other guy that i know um craig who was yeah bodybuilding like kind of really into that it just obsessed and he always says to me that you know if he picked up a drink he's never had a drink in his life but he's like fit as anything but if he didn't have that and it was the reverse then he could have been in trouble it's a really yeah it's a really interesting thing bodybuilding is a really fascinating one because i had these kind of you know preconceptions of bodybuilders it's all about vanity uh insecurity body dysmorphia whatever but actually having spent you know a lot of time in some now what it seems to do for people is it's a really attractive sport for people who have very chaotic inconsistent parenting as kids yeah like maybe there was parental drug use or they just didn't know what to expect from a parent from one day to the next and then maybe they go through this kind of chaotic phase in their teens and 20s they discover bodybuilding and suddenly it's all like structure yeah it's like macros, micros, calculating your food, going to the gym, sets, reps, writing it all down. Yeah. And so like, it's a completely amazing solution for that problem. And that's what I love about the people in this book. They've found solutions. And sometimes people read it and go, oh, they're just harming their bodies. But maybe not as much as they would have had they not found this cool thing. <laughs> <they're doing. laughs> yeah. Yeah. So did you naturally find yourself kind of when, when you stop the substances and all that sort of stuff, did you naturally find yourself just pursuing other activities, I guess, obsessively might be the word. I didn't find sport until much later. Yeah. Shame. Um, but I did. So about a year and a half into not drinking, I was just so flat and yeah, I wouldn't say suicidal, but I was definitely wondering what the point of anything was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I decided to do this blog where I had to do something new every day for a year. <clears throat> and so things like I would help one day, I helped somebody working on the train tracks. Another day I um, flew a plane or Kofu. Nice. Um, well, wow. sometimes it wasn't, you know, it had to be something I put together quite quickly, but it was, it got my attention and hooked it, yeah. the purpose, most importantly. Yeah. And validation, because I blogged about it. So I had, had an audience, all the things that maybe drugs and alcohol had given me in the past, like yeah. being that nutter who's going to do go the extra mile, <laughs> but also focus, like you're focused on getting to the perfect high. That is actually, in, your, in, in a way, a productive mission. Yeah in a way like it's having the same effects on your brain as doing some other more genuinely productive mission a hundred percent so you need that when you when you quit you need desperately some kind of mission some kind of purpose for me it wasn't sport at that point but i did find something yeah yeah so it's it's interesting do you find and did you find this when you were writing about the people in your book that are kind of doing these extreme things like that there was any self-judgment or do they talk a lot about judgment from others in terms of the ways that they're doing this kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, the first chapter is on ultra runners and more than any sport, it does seem to attract people who've got a background of addiction. Wow. I think there's a lot of similarities in a way, like you're in it for the long haul. It's self-flagellation. It's something you do on your own. It's very ruminative, meditative, meditative. Uh, <laughs> you get the high, yes. um, but there's also this kind of 
bloody minded validation of people are like, are you really going to run that much? And so one of my main interviewees, Charlie Engel, uh, he said he used to get the same kick out of people going, are you really going to run four days straight across the Sahara? As he did when he was buying crack and the dealer would go, are you really going to smoke that much? Wow. Yeah, to him it was the same. Anyway, Charlie, who's one of many people who've written memoirs about going from addiction to running, yeah. uh, he said um, he gets a lot of concerned, concerned comments from people about what he's going to be doing to his body, like running these long distances. Yeah. Um, and he said he gets way more concerned comments now doing a sport that he loves <laughs> than he did when he was wasted. You know, you know, because it's, it, I think it's unbelievable. Impacts, well, I think people feel uncomfortable watching other people do healthy stuff, even if it tips over into unhealthy because you push yourself. It's, I suppose also it's easier to criticize someone doing that than it is criticizing someone who is taking a lot of drugs and therefore is probably in a lot of pain. You don't want to face it. So you don't want to have that conversation. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's, it's really interesting that you say that, right? Because I find through the, the, and I know, again, I know that there's context around this stuff, but I find that people with substance addictions or whatever it is that come in through like the treatment system, there's just this huge judgment around, yeah, if people want to go and exercise seven days a week at the gym or whatever, it's like, oh no, you can't do that because you're just transferring your addiction yeah. over and it's like, well, maybe that might help. <laughs> yeah, you get that all the time. Are you just swapping one addiction for another? So what? Yeah. <laughs> That's and? Right. <laughs> That's right. And, and, you know, obviously it comes down to the individual and you've got to assess it. But a lot of the time these things can be healthy. It's, it's funny that you mention it. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not freaking out ultra runner or anything by any stretch of the imagination. But the only way that. Like I have to, I've learned that about myself that I have to go with my makeup. I used to try and fight it and do like a balanced life. And, mm -hmm. but that's not me. I can't, I can't do it. And the only way I can get fit and healthy is by doing like some stupid challenge. You know, I'm doing one at the moment where you got to like do all this stuff for like 75 days in a row. And like, I find it difficult, but it's the only way I can concentrate on something and give myself some like you said like some purpose to to yeah. do it we're, we're what my shrink used to call the distractors <laughs> um and i think ultimately he was saying you know distracting is just an inevitable way of not addressing emotional pain but he also said which is very true meditation and yoga aren't for everyone but that's all you get fucking prescribed isn't it that's right any kind of mental health treatment any kind of drug and alcohol treatment <laughs> all, you know, all yoga and meditation it's not for everyone and mindfulness That's for, right. for a start some people just cannot sit still but yep. also it's maybe not great for people who've had a trauma background it's 100%. been proven that it's not yeah 100 percent. so interesting um so <sighs> you touched on that control thing before when you were talking about the bodybuilders it's something that i hear so much from people that come in for treatment or are talking about giving up their substance addiction. The place where I hear it the most actually is, and, and that's often through that same avenue if people have like sort of a co-occurring issue or whatever, but if they've got, um, yeah, challenges or issues around, around eating or, or body image and things like that, that issue in particular, people say, it's all about control. It's got nothing like always. That's the common feedback. Did you find that if, even if people articulated it or, um, or they didn't, but did you find that across all those different domains that it was like this way of controlling themselves? Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. I mean, often really the things that the people I interviewed are doing could be almost classified as self-harm whether it's putting yourself in the, <laughs> yeah. like whether you're putting yourself in the ring or you're hanging from hooks in your flesh <laughs> or any number of the other things that the people do in this book run till you know their feet are flapping um yeah it, it's it's in a way it's self-punishment it's also controlling the body and I feel that it's especially appealing to people who maybe who didn't have much control over their body when they were younger. Yeah. It's almost like saying, you work for me now. You yeah. Know? 
And I found that a lot of my interviews had a very dispassionate view of their body, considering a lot of them were professional athletes and their body was doing for them what they were asking it to. They still had a really complex relationship with it. Like interesting, not giving it the recovery time it needs, not pampering it, treating it like a machine, getting really upset and angry when it couldn't do their bidding. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, from a ballet dancer I interviewed who just really had to work for decades on getting a good relationship with their body. Yeah. Um, sometimes also sport hides a eating disorder. Yeah. Um, because it's more socially acceptable. Is that you can just, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just looks like you're super fit, but actually, it's a, another way of rationing your food and or, or burning it off. Yeah, but you also have a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, I think they're just the things you have to look out for. You know, everyone's always got to be very aware of themselves and always monitoring themselves. So I just think, you know, if you choose to throw yourself into a pursuit in a more productive way than, say, just snorting tons of drugs, yeah, and you just got to be aware that there may be some pitfalls that you've got to keep an eye out on and keep yeah. correcting, you know? Yeah, 100%. So, uh, like, the writing of this book, did it come out of the passion of you, like, and I know you kind of mentioned this before, but of you doing sport and finding this outlet for yourself and sort of noticing some of the similarities, I guess, to maybe like some substance addiction or other like obsessive behaviors or whatever it is, right? Is that kind of where it came out of? Or was it was it something else that you discovered in, in another, you know, aspect of your life? It was actually from this one chapter of Women of Substances, the addiction book I wrote, called total wow. control so it just relates back to what you were saying i was thinking about how people use drugs sometimes to seize back control over their body yep and i thought i'm not quite done with that topic i think people do that in all different ways and i also wanted to look at endurance because i remember you know i used to it used to be like day two or three of a bend there it'd be four in the morning and i'd be like drink drinking another shot or having another cigarette. And it's this kind of like fascination with the, you know, with the human body and what you can put it through. Yeah. And so I saw athletes as doing that in a kind of a different way. So I yeah. kind of wanted to look at those parallels too. So it was all, yeah, it was all about our relationships with our bodies and control and endurance. Yeah. And at the same time, yeah, I started this mission. I wanted to have a kickboxing fight. Yeah. Um, so I started training and it was such a, extraordinary thing to do for someone who's never done a sport because it's all about controlling your ego um putting yourself on the line in a completely different kind of way yeah nobody cares about your reputation as a journalist in a book. <laughs> nobody's heard of the guardian so, <laughs> so it was real a real full-on thing to do and a really healthy thing to do to completely be continuously humiliated as if i haven't had enough of that in my life but in a kind of <laughs> And have to decide if you're going to keep getting back up and going back. And so yeah, it was a really, a really cool thing to do. I highly recommend it. Yeah. I like, do you know what? The, the, the people that I know that have done something similar to you all say the same thing about uh, martial art. Oh. Now, for consistency purposes, you've removed your hat. Oh, I know. I'm going to put it back on because I'm self-conscious about I've been bald for like years now but it grows on the side like a george costanza and at the moment it's got a bit of growth <laughs> um sorry we dropped out there yeah sorry um uh so i, I was gonna say um uh what was i gonna say um oh yeah that's that's what i was gonna ask so out of writing this book and talking to all these like fascinating people what what were your takeaways like what's your what's your biggest lessons learned and you know how can it help you and or you know what would you recommend to other people what are the what are the wisdom bombs that you've grabbed out of it mm. um i talked a lot to these people about identity and the way that we completely tie our identity to what it is we do and so for me it used to be i'm the heavy drinking journalist yeah. i'm like I'm Hunter S. Thompson, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, you know, I, I follow in that lineage. 
Um, and then I, for each book that I've written, I've sort of attached my identity to that book. But yeah. each time you do that, and athletes know this better than anyone, each time you do that, and then it's taken away from you because it's finished or you have to retire or whatever it is, you're adrift. Yeah. It just shows you how, how shaky your sense of self is if you <laughs> construct it around the thing that you do. And so many people do that. Like, like I hate fucking social events these days. I can't stand it. But um, <laughs> it's a great endorsement for myself if anyone's <laughs> listening. But um, no, but like you go and you say to people like, oh, um, how are you going? Tell me about yourself. They'll be like, I'm an accountant or I'm a fighter or I'm a, you know, they, they just tell you what they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's sports psychologists at the moment, like a huge emphasis of what they do is about broadening the athlete's sense of who they are. Yeah. Because at some point, if you're an athlete, you're probably going to be retiring at about 33 if you're not injured before then. Yes. So, and then you're absolutely screwed because you have just sacrificed everything for that one thing and you've, you're only known for that. Yeah. So they try and broaden the sense of, well, you're also, you know, an uncle you're also somebody who enjoys doing this you're also really good at this um so that's something i've oh, probably haven't taken it on board yet but um something that came out out of it but also the fact that if we're really goal driven we don't have much balance in our life we're just chasing goals all the time and then you achieve them and then again you're adrift and then you've got to ch- like hustle around for the next projects uh, so, you, so you need also a balance. You need things which are called atelic activities. So telic is your goal-driven activities, which have an end point. Could be a medal, could be a book that comes out, could be a podcast that comes out. Yeah. And then atelic is something you do for sheer enjoyment's sake, no fanfare. And I looked at my life and I had nothing. <laughs> I, wow. yeah. I do now. I have the stick fighting because yeah. I'm not going to compete in stick fighting. <laughs> So I just do it every day for the sheer enjoyment. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can see, I can see the value in that. I'm not, yeah. I was going to say I'm not posting on Instagram. That's a total lie. <laughs> um, you should check out my Instagram page and look at me doing it. Look at me. <laughs> but I'm not going to compete or anything like that. So it's important to have those kind of things in our life as well, where we just do it for enjoyment's sake. Yeah, hundred oh, percent. I love that. So the, for me, the identity thing, that, that's been such a big revelation over the years for me as well, um, is the identity thing and just how, like, unless you consciously kind of look at it, just how wrapped up you can be in your things and your stuff and what you do and all that, all that kind of jazz. And if it's not going your way, you're miserable. So you, you never really, again, that word control, you're never really in control of your own happiness because it's completely dictated to yeah. by the outside stuff because you can never win every fight unless you could, could be but yeah. you know you know and you can never have everything go your way whatever you're doing so yeah you're in control yeah. of the external circumstance so yeah that that's been huge for me as well i think that's um, why in recovery as well so no, no 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 i think that's why in recovery circles buddhism is so huge a hundred percent because it's all, you know, about not getting attached to things, letting things go. And I, I was never going to fully get into that. Yeah. I, did, I did give it a go, but it wasn't but, for me. But you can appreciate some aspects of it, right? Yeah, 100%. And I know, like, and I don't mean to sound hypercritical, but it's funny even with that Buddhism thing, right? Even that for people becomes like their identity you know they start wearing i don't even know what they're called but the pants and the <laughs> beads and you know all that stuff which is cool it's great i'm not it's awesome whatever floats your boat but yeah it's funny how you can just get wrapped up in in so much stuff it's uh it's yeah. interesting yeah we, we can't help it. it's human nature <laughs> that's right that's right so um yeah fascinating to finally get you on mate and and have a chat um where can people find you on the gram and watch you whacking shit with your with your stick (laughs) yeah it's jenny valentish which is v-a-e no it's not (laughs) v-a-l-e-n-t-i-s-h underscore public awesome Uh, yeah and i've really really enjoyed this thank you so much 
No worries. No worries. Now, everybody listening, um, don't be scared. Shamelessly buy the shit out of the new book. Um, it'll be a fascinating read. It's on, it's on my reading list. I've, I've gone through a bit of it from what Jenny sent me and I'm, I'm fascinated because that's what I was going to actually ask you as well, just before we finish, like, and I've even, I've never really been one for that because I, I um, do have my obsessive outlets. Um, but I've noticed lately with kind of social media and just becoming like a little fanboy of, you know, people and stuff like that. I've wanted to go and do some like crazy shit almost as like activities or, you know, and I've noticed them being like popping up, popping up. I know it's been pandemic and COVID and stuff, but um, you know, people going on like trips where they smash out like these crazy activity trips or fitness camps, you know, the, a lot of people do the ones, the, the Muay Thai camps in um, Thailand and stuff like that. Um, why is that happening? Do you think that's because of the internet and people like David Goggins, like, you know, <laughs> making oh, that kind of cool? <laughs> Goggins has got a lot to answer for, for sure. Like, um, I mean, how many, he's got millions of followers, isn't he? And it's just a cult-like following. Uh I think we're, yeah, there is definitely a real trend for pushing out of the comfort zone, but spending shit loads, ironically, spending shit loads of money doing it. <laughs> like, I know, you could just run around the street until you yeah. fall over. <laughs> no, you need these headphones. You need this special, you know, sleeping device. It costs thousands of dollars. And so it's this weird kind of thing where everyone's like going full Goggins, but going broke at the same time doing it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But yeah, I blame Instagram. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny. So, but I, I'm all for it. Um, read the book, get involved in some David Goggins shit. Soon they'll be saying in 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 some. <laughs> in some if, uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and and enjoy. But thanks for coming on, mate. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>